All right, let's start with the class. Lecture number six. I'm glad so many people actually made it, even with the snow. Um, as you might know, I do record these lectures. They are all linked from the website, but don't take it for guarantee that the videos will show up because sometimes I have hardware problems, something crashes, and then there won't be a video. So don't, most of them will be there for you as a reference. Next year, it will probably be better because some of the videos are already there from the last year, but we will see. Hopefully, it all works out. Okay, last time we covered the AHB and the APB buses, and there are significantly different ways of how to use these buses compared to the external buses. So these internal buses, the five-layer AHB bus matrix and the APB bus, they get used and accessed by using um, logic, so VHDL or Verilog. Now, in reality, once you use a microcontroller, you usually have no access to these buses because they are internal, they are inside of the chip, peripherals use it to talk to the microcontroller, but usually you don't have access to these kind of buses. But in our particular case where we have an FPGA, we actually have to use these buses and you can generate these buses using your FPGA because now you have the dynamic to actually write the peripheral by yourself. The external buses, that's usually what you have in microcontrollers and what you use to extend um, your embedded systems and hook up external components like, for example, um, digital sensors, um, flash memories, and other types, SRAM memories, etc., etc. And these are accessed by physical wires. So remember, in these internal buses, they are designed with logic. The external ones is where you actually hook up wires to a pad on your, piece, on the, on your chip to access them. So why not just export the AHP Lite and the APB? We had his questions last time, and I think he asked the exact right questions to tell you why this is not possible. Yeah, for the AHP, we would need almost 100 pins itself, right, to actually export it. Yes? Do you have the smart fusions where it's got those gigantic mm -hmm. VR memory interface? So <coughs> they're not exporting it, no. But in theory, on the smart fusion, you could export the AHP bus because you have actually enough pads and enough I.O. lines that you, in theory, could take the AHB and put it out on the bus. But the problem is you won't find any kind of peripheral to hook up to it because all of these things are written in Verilog. They get put into chips themselves. So it doesn't make much sense. Yes? What's the motivation that we would want to export from the chip again? It's fast. It's really, really fast. That would be a longer distance? You would go over longer distances, yes, but it's still an extremely fast bus if you could somehow manage to get it through the pads and outside of the chip. But the problem is it's so many wires, it becomes impractical. It's faster if it's on the chip. Sorry? It will still be fast, yes. Why would we want to do that? You could have an external memory or something like that hooked up to it. That would then be directly memory mapped I.O. onto the AHP. And you will see why in a second, how we use memory, external memory, how it's slower than using the SRAM, for example. Okay. So let's talk quickly about asynchronous memory, which would be one of these things hooked up to one of these external buses. Yes. The AHP bus matrix, because it's a multi-master bus system, so you can have multiple masters using the bus at the same time. So you have to have multiple layers of how the routing basically can go. I'm not entirely sure what the implementation is, but if, if, it, if you're really interested in it, look in the Smart Fusion data sheet, and they talk about the AHP bus matrix and everything in detail, and how it's implemented and how you can use it. So let's talk about asynchronous memory. This is, for example, an external SRAM memory. It has 20-bit addresses, has 8-bit data bus, Chip enable, write enable, and an output enable. Why would anybody use a chip like this? Why would you want to need external SRAM? How much memory do you have on your Smart Fusion? 256 or 512, depending on which version. And that's non-volatile memory. How much RAM do you have? 64K, right? So you don't really have that much memory on there. 
Imagine you want to make an MP3 player, right? You have 256K, that's, that's not even a song where you can store it there. <coughs> Nevertheless, you also need code somewhere, right? Or assume you want to run Linux on your microcontroller. Linux needs about two megabytes of storage. I think maybe a little less, maybe one. Still, <coughs> you couldn't run it on a microcontroller that only has 256K of flash, no, no less than 64K of RAM. So you need to extend your memory. This would be a solution of getting SRAM, fairly fast memory, into your microcontroller by hooking it up to one of your peripherals. So if you look at the definitions on these data sheets, you can see that the chip enable, output enable, and write enable will give all the different signals for reading and writing into your microcontroller. For example, if the chip enable is high, both of these states the chip doesn't care what it is, the chip is not enabled. Once chip enable is low, output enable and write enable will tell what happens inside of your memory bank. So if output enable is low, write enable is high, you're going to read from the device. If write enable gets, goes low, we don't care what the output enable is about, we're going to write into the device. And if both of them are high, the device goes into high Z mode. Yes? So does this imply that writes have a priority over reads? Yes. So what happens is you can actually make the model of this whole device fairly easily. You can imagine you have like an address input buffer over here. You have a row decoder and a column decoder for the address that you have. And then you have a squared memory over here. Using the row and the column decoder, you access a certain memory region inside of this memory bank. And you then have a control logic with the chip enable, write enable, and output enable that uses the IO buffer to either push that data into your memory, or take the data that's on here and push it out onto the data lines. Fairly simple. Yes? Now, a device like this, you need a lot of pins to interface with. Are you going to make up this layer? Is this something that you would only want an interface with an interface device? Well, we will talk about that. Okay. <laughs> so if you look at the definition on here, um, there is no clock line, right? So how can you figure out how fast you can write into one of these devices? Or, for that matter, read from the device? Sorry? Like, well, I don't know, I think it's the system might be a clock, right? Some sort of handshake. A handshake? Yeah, and how fast do you do the handshaking? Right? Can you go as fast as you want? Most likely not, because your memory array here has a certain latency to get the data out to your output buffers or actually get it from the output buffers into the memory itself. And then if you go to the data sheet, you will see something like this, timing diagrams. So your device is completely asynchronous. This memory is asynchronous. But your device has a clock. So you have to manage your device and set the clock rates right in order to match the timing definitions of one of these chips. So let's look at a read cycle here. As you can see, what happens is the address has to be there. Chip enable gets pulled low. Remember, that's the only thing on how anything happens in this chip anyway. Then the output enable has to come after the chip enable happened. And then the data out comes sometimes later, defined by the TA and the TAC lines. And you can see there are multiple definitions for the same timing, right? So <coughs> there is a limit on TAA, there is a limit on TAC, and sometimes they can be different. So sometimes you have to have the address on the bus earlier than the data actually comes out. Most of the times, these two times are actually the exact same thing. Okay. A write enable controlled write cycle. What happens? Output enable, we don't care at all. Chip enable gets pulled low, write enable has to be pulled low, and then there is a different timing that happens until the data has to be valid on the bus in order to be written into it. And there has to be a time the data has to held, be held stable in order for the chip to actually put this into the memory before you can actually turn it off. A um, chip enable controlled write cycle. What happens is the chip enable gets pulled low after the write enable gets set. So there are two ways of actually doing it with different timing diagrams. Let's look at a different chip. This is an asynchronous NOR flash memory has up to 25-bit address bus, 
um, can have a 16-bit data bus. So remember the, four, the one before had only 8 data. This one now has 16-bit data. Chip enable, write enable, output enable, similar as before. It then has a byte interface, which can actually switch this chip between 8-bit mode and 16-bit mode. We have a write protect and a read busy signal, and you have a reset. The timing diagram looks slightly more complicated because now the outputs are high C, you have the reset line, the ready bit in this particular case, so this is a read cycle. Chip enable goes down, output enable goes down, write enable goes up, and the output becomes valid at some point. So now let's do an exercise. This is the data sheet for this particular chip. Let's try to figure out how fast we can read from this particular asynchronous memory. So I'm pulling this up here. <clears throat> um, All right. And we go one back. Can groups of two together try to figure out how fast you can write, read from this particular device? So going, wait. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Confuse myself here. Try to figure out, match the signals that are written in here, match them with the signals that you see over here, and figure out what you can do in order to read from this device. Okay, where do you start? What does your intuition as engineers tell you? Or computer scientists, I'm sorry. You start to look at this, right? So, what will tell you timing? Well, let's start simple. When can you start the next transaction on this device using it, looking at this timing diagram? At the end, right? Like over here somewhere, right? So over here, the next one of these can start. Is this one here important, this timing? A reset? Not really. Not for maximum speed, because you're not going to go reset your chip all the time. That's usually high and just stays there. So it's somewhere over here that we start with a write enable. So we go a write enable, chip enable, output enable. It has to happen. Before these two lines can go high, this comes out and then the data is down. Correct? Okay. How long is this time here? TCEH. Chip enable hold time, 35 nanoseconds. So the chip has to be enabled for at least 35 nanoseconds. Right? It says minimum 35 nanoseconds. Before um, yeah, from the right enable to here. Now, what's the next one? Sorry? How much is it? PCE. PCE is, well, oh, it's this here. That's odd. different options, exactly. Different speed options. You can get them at 90 nanoseconds or very slow 130 nanoseconds. So let's take the 90 nanosecond one because we want to be fast. So it's 90 nanoseconds for this guy here. What about this? TACC. How long does that have to be? Also 90, exactly. So this has to be as long as this here, right? At the minimum. So we have 35, 90, and then what? What happens now? Exactly, you have to hold the address for a certain amount of time. That's, is it TOH? No. That's when we close the whole thing down. Well, actually, at this point here, you're good to go. So you have to have a certain hold time here, TOH, output hold time from address chip enabled. Well, that's your, that's convenient. 
So this can basically be zero. So basically, as soon as this happens here, we are good. We are good to go. The data can be read, and then we can break everything down. What about TDF? TDF, chip enabled to output high Z. 20 nanoseconds. Okay, so we add another 20 nanoseconds at the end. What gives that to us? The minimum, 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 fastest thing you could do with this chip. 145 Sorry? 145 minutes. 145, so it's 90 plus 35 plus 20. Mm -hmm. All right, that's what kind of speed? So how many megabits per second would that be? Uh, what's the width of the data comes on this guy? Ah, yeah, good question. It's 25. So you can do 25 million transactions in a second. So did, you, did everybody understand what the question is? No? OK. The question is, how big is the data bus? Right? We now figured out how fast we can read from it. But in order to calculate how much data we can put through, we need to know how big the data bus is. In this case, this chip can have either 8 or 16-bit data. In this particular case, we actually don't see it. So let's just say it's the full 16-bit to get, see what, we, what the maximum data rate could be. So it's 110 megabytes or megabits. That's, that's transactions times 16. Times, OK. That will be oh, megabit. Uh, that, that is bits, right? How much? 110 megabits, megabits per second. Is that much? Not so much? What do you guys think? 110 megabits per second. How fast is Ethernet? It depends on, depends on which one, but 100 megabit was actually fairly decent just a couple few years ago. These days it's gigabit. But so 110 is actually really not fast, right? Comparing to network connections. Turns out this is not a very fast flash chip. At the same time, this is also flash and not RAM. SRAM, you could probably read a lot faster out than this flash chip here, per se. So assume you had this chip. How could you go faster than 110 megabits? But this is the only chip I give you. What could you do? Yes. You can have them in parallel. <coughs> Let's look at this in a second on how we could actually improve. Yeah? It also, so this chip, won't, you have to address every single read, right? Like you can't do burst reads or burst writes if you wanted to. So could that, be. That would speed up too. It could be. So sometimes you can, if you tell the chip that I want to read starting from this address for that many bytes or just keep reading, it will just keep incrementing and spitting out the data. And that sometimes can go a lot faster. But I'm not sure if this particular chip has burst modes. It might. OK. Another nice part about memory controller interfaces is that you don't really need the memory on the outside. For example, in this particular case, we have an LCD controller that mimics a memory device. So it looks like as if it were memory, and you can hook it up to a high-speed memory interface, but instead of writing into a memory, you're actually writing into the LCD controller's registers, and that way you can update or refresh an LCD extremely fast using a memory interface. So this case here, this is actually the memory controller chip, the LED that you have on the Smart Fusion, which is a 96 by 16 OLED panel that has a memory interface or an I2C interface. And I think in your case, on the Smart Fusion, it's hooked up as an I2C device, not as a memory interface. But the same device could be used either through I2C serial, which we will talk about later, or through this particular memory interface. Okay, now comes the question, so how do we hook up such a memory into our Smart, smart Fusion? Or for that particular case, in any kind of microcontroller. And usually what you have is an external memory controller, or EMC. There are lots of different bus systems out there. You probably have heard about ISA, VESA, AGP, PCI, VMI, IDE, CF. They're all different definitions for slightly different types of devices. Microcontrollers often have integrated external memory controllers that can mimic different types of memories. 
and that can talk to different types of memories by configuring them appropriately. In our case, the EMC on the Smart Fusion has a memory location starting at 7000 and goes up to 77FFFFF. That's a lot of memory, right, that we can address. <clears throat> How much is it? How much memory can we address? Anybody have a calculator? Because I don't have it in my notes here either. How much? Two by ten bytes. Two to the ten. That would be only a k, one kilobyte. This must be a lot more than that. Two to the twenty-six. That sounds more like it. How much is that? Sixty-seven meg. Megabyte. So 64 megabytes. We can add 64 megabytes of external memory through the EMC, which is really neat. And as you can see, it's actually mapped into your memory space. So by you just going and reading that memory location, it will actually go outside of your chip into the memory, read it from there, and give it back to you on your AHP bus as if it were just flash storage, as long as you configured your EMC appropriately. So the EMC now offers an external interface of two different chip selects. It has eight or 16-bit shared data bus, so you can configure it what you want to use. It can generate write enables, can translate the 32-bit AHP transfers into half-word or byte transfers. So you actually don't care on the core if you read from the EMC. You just read 32 bytes, and it will actually generate the right transactions on the outside, either 16 half-words or byte transfers. And you can also um, automatically align misaligned addresses. So if you do a mistake in your, in your read and write, it will actually align them appropriately for you in how to do it. This is the interface definition. What you can see here is the AHP interface up here. Down here you have um, the control itself of the whole EMC and how to configure the EMC. It sits at a different memory location where you set up all your configurations for it. And then you hook it up through an I.O. bank to your external memory device, or EMD. Makes sense so far? Yeah? Maybe? Not really? So what happens? You, you're going to read from the AHB, right? You can have a read transaction on your AHB on here, somewhere within the 7,000 memory range that we saw just before. The EMC takes that read and translates it into an external memory interface definition. Now we just heard they are significantly different, right? Like you can up over here, you can have 32-bit data reads. Well, this interface here can only have eight or 16-bit transfers. So the EMC actually takes care of these kind of things and necessarily generates multiple reads and writes from out here from this device to present and give you an answer on the EMC. So just a quick, um, quick rehash, we have a read transaction and a write transaction, right? Pipelined extremely fast. Now if we add the EMC in there, it's not very fast anymore because all of a sudden you have to talk to an external device. Sometimes you have to do multiple reads and writes from it. So what the EMC has to do is it has to add wait states into your transactions. So all of a sudden your AHP that was super fast becomes slightly slower. But at the convenience of extreme easily use for you, you just read and write memory locations, the EMC does the rest. So what would happen is, for example, the AHP would have a retransfer with wait states, similar to what we had here before. It sets up the address, wants to do the next one, but has to wait because the EMC says, hey, wait, I have to do a transaction off chip. You need to wait until you get your data over here. This is a more in-detail example of how this would work and um, how the EMC actually does this particular operation. In this case, we have the AHP and the EMC uses an extra cycle for the EMC to actually set up everything on the outside. So that's up here is the AHP. This is the EMD interface. We have the address space, so the EMC now knows something is going to happen. It will set up the address on the outside. And in the next cycle, it tells you, OK, we need to wait. It will do the chip select for the outside, to the outside chip, 
We will do an output enable. We'll get the read from here and then push this out onto the data bus later on. So this data that got read here will use one extra cycle to appear on the AHB. It's not very efficient use of the AHB because all of a sudden, if you just do one read from it, you have to wait. Instead of just having it in the next clock cycle, we have to wait for one, two, three, four clock cycles. And depending on what type of chip you have out there, this might be even longer, depending on how fast you actually can read and write to it. Any questions on this? How the translation works? From the AHB into the external memory interface and back? No? Okay. So how does it do all this translation stuff? Right? You have a lot of virtual memory or memory locations for the EMC that somehow get mapped into a, into a chip out on the outside. So here is a case for when we do a 32-bit read on the AHB bus. What's actually happening is that it gets translated into multiple reads or writes, depending on what you do, in your memory location on your chip. And the addresses really get just translated over into the other space. So if you have one address space going from 000, uh, 7000 over here to 77FFF, what happens is that this address 0 gets actually mapped to its address 0 on the outside chip. For the second chip select, you go from 74 up to 77FFF. Right. This should be a 3 over here. This is a mistake. So you have two chip selects for two 64 megabyte, megabytes M spaces. They get mapped to do the different chip selects. So if you have two different chips, they get start at the bottom and just go up in byte order. So before we asked, so how can you go faster or have a faster chip? Well, you can have chips in parallel. If you use, for example, a byte type device, you can hook up both of them in parallel, but choose the two addresses differently. So the, the last bit has to be different on the addresses. In addition to that, you can have them share the data bus. So what you do is you have one chip is hooked up to 0 to 7 on the data bus. The other chip, you hook it up to 8 to 15 on the data bus. And now the address, if you actually look at it, the 0 bit gets dropped. This one has address 1 to 250 and 1 to 250. Bit 0 is not even connected at all. And now if you actually address and write into it, and you, you control your EMC and tell him that this is actually one chip that has a 16-bit data interface, the right thing will happen. What happens is the following. Bit 0 will be put onto the lower one. Uh, byte 2 will be put in this one. The next one will be put in this one. This byte will be put in and the one up there. Right. So the EMC takes care of the mapping between your memory, your AHP on how you address it, and how it's distributed out on your memory chips outside. And sometimes you can play some interesting tricks. So pushing this one further, oops, pushing this one further, you can actually have, since you have two different chip selects, you can have two chips up here and two chips down here, both sharing a byte interface, but interfacing them into the same memory location. A different example, you don't have to just be asynchronous. The EMC also can generate your clock if you, in case you have a synchronous device. In this case, the EMC gives your clock into your chip outside, and then you have, yet and again, a different memory interface. So the EMC is extremely versatile. You, all you have to do is actually figure out how to configure it right, set up the timings right and appropriately for your external memory chip, and once you have it set up correctly, it's really easy to use from your code Right? In your C code, all you do is you just make a pointer, point it into the EMC address, or have an array or something like that, and then you start reading and writing from it. The EMC will do the rest of storing it out there or reading from it. Yes? In the, in, would you define something like this in the linker script, where you say, I have this much memory, no. and now I have even more here? It's probably in the boot up of your device. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't tell C to extend the size of the stack? by saying, you have memory at this location and memory at these locations. You probably could, but you have to make sure that the EMC is set up before 
you start using that stack up there. You... So yes, actually, no, yes, you're right. You, you could put code into these memory locations. Well, not just code, but have C treat it like a stack. You, you could, yeah. You probably can put the stack up there. But you have to set this up. But you have to configure this, this EMC before you move the stack pointer up there. Yes. Well, you can do that. You can have startup code. And yeah, I'm not saying you could not. But you just have to take care of it and see. OK, open discussions. Any questions? Questions on labs? Questions on the homework? Anything? <laughs>